Fifteen years ago this month, the Rwandan massacre began. It lasted for 100 days and claimed 800,000 lives. In Rwanda, a national week of mourning has come to an end. The country paused to remember members of the Tutsi ethnic minority and moderate Hutus targeted in the killings. There have been vigils around the world as well. In Kigali, President Paul Kagame told mourners that the people of Rwanda were abandoned in 1994 by those appointed to protect them. The life must go on. And we must continue to build for a better future. VOA's Alex Belida covered the Rwandan genocide during uh, his eight years as correspondent in Africa. Alex, welcome to In Focus. Thanks. Now, I know that you did enter Rwanda from the eastern part of that country and went to this place called Nyarubuye. First share with us, how was it just getting into the country? Well, in that particular trip, we had uh, come in from Uganda overland, um, joining up uh, on the border with an escort from the Rwandese Patriotic Front, who took us down into the area outside of Kigali, uh, and also into uh, eastern Rwanda, um, down towards the Rusumo Bridge crossing into Tanzania. And it was uh, during a stop there that we had heard of a massacre site. And several reporters and I decided to go there uh, with our vehicles. And uh, we went to this small village called Nyarubuya. Now you arrive there. Give us your impressions, your first impressions on arriving there. Well, I knew it was going to be something that I and the others had never really experienced before. And I made a conscious decision to turn on my tape recorder and simply record what I saw. Uh, and so here we are pulling up in front of a church uh, with sort of tall grass, beautiful flowers around it. And immediately we stepped out of our vehicles and saw corpses lying in the grass. Um, the corpses of men, women, and children. Um, they had been laying there since uh, for several weeks uh, by the time we saw them. And this church complex, which, which included not only the church, but some administrative buildings, some classrooms, uh, workshop, and so on, ended up, as we walked through it, just being filled with bodies. You did uh, come upon some people around the area who were alive. Uh, now, uh, explain to us briefly, how did they relate the accounts to you of what had happened there? They told us that on about April 14th, so just several days after what we call the start of the genocide, um, a group of Interahamwe entered the village and started killing all of the ethnic Tutsi members of the village. Um, many of them had fled into the church for protection, and obviously they did not find it. Uh, in addition to uh, people being killed with machetes, people were shot with shotguns, uh, people were pursued off the church grounds into the surrounding fields where they were attempting to flee down towards the Kagera River and the Tanzanian border. Uh, and that whole area was littered with bodies as well. Sometimes people get the impression that uh, the Hutus were killing the Tutsis, but I do know that you met a few or some Hutus who are in fact uh, protecting Tutsis. Indeed. Oh. There were some in the village. Uh, we met a couple, an elderly couple, uh, who were being cared for by a younger relative who had protected a Tutsi woman. Uh, and I remember very graphically this elderly gentleman um, describing what had happened in Yarabuya, uh eventually came up with this phrase that he told us that as he heard people being killed, he said he himself felt that he was being hacked. And it was a horrible feeling, the feeling that you were being hacked too. Now, this is a very horrifying kind of a situation. As a reporter, you are filing your stories back to Washington. But as you look through the media, as you listen to the international radio on the watch television, did you get the sense that this story was being carried by the media and given the priority that uh, it deserved? Well, I think it was being reported at the time. Um, there were, however, a couple of problems. First of all, from a policy standpoint, you'll recall some governments were 
uh, in, their, in their capitals, including the United States, were refusing to recognize that what was happening was genocide. And being there on the ground and seeing what was in fact happening, uh, it was very uh, disheartening that, mm -hmm. that it wasn't being officially recognized. The second point was that as several of my colleagues who were photographers and cameramen said, nobody wanted to run the pictures of what they were seeing. So they were having to go to extreme lengths to try and take pictures that weren't too um, graphic, yet at the same time conveyed the scale of the death. Mm -hmm. As a reporter talking to officials, talking to the uh, UN chief there, uh, General Dallaire, did you get a sense that this could have been prevented or at least the deaths could have been minimized? I think so. Uh, General Dallaire certainly felt that way. Uh, he told me in Kigali uh, in late April uh, that, uh, and, and again in subsequent conversations we had before he left the country, that he had made an effort in late 1993 several months before the genocide began, uh, to seek permission to extend his, his mandate, the UN's peacekeeping mandate, to enable him to go seize weapons, caches, machetes, and so on, uh, and to uh, start providing protection to officials of the Hutu or moderate, uh, moderate Hutus or Tutsis who they knew were being on a death list to provide them protection. Yeah. Uh, and he, he was denied permission to, to expand his mandate to do this. You know, we'd like to hear more uh, from you about all this. Perhaps you'll write a book about all this and tell us what you saw, and uh, perhaps uh, future generations will learn from you. I appreciate your encouragement, <laughs> Vincent. Thank you very much. That's uh, our you. own Alex Belida uh, sharing his account of the Rwanda genocide.